Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm Kevin McPartland. I am the head of research for the market structure and technology team here at Coalition Greenwich. Uh, we're excited for this conversation this morning titled Conduct Compliance and Ethics in Capital Markets. Uh, before we get started with today's discussion, let me cover a few housekeeping items. Questions are welcome. Uh, so please use the question box and we will answer as many of those as we can, either throughout or at the end. If there are questions we don't get to, um, we will try to follow up after the fact. Uh, after the event, you will be asked to participate in a brief survey to let us know what you liked, um, what you think we could do better next time. We do look at those responses, so please take the two minutes to do that if you can. Uh, and finally, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, and we will distribute a link to everybody registered after the fact, so please keep an eye out for that if there's anything you wanted to go back and check. Uh, and with that, we have a great panel this morning. Should be a really interesting conversation, um, lots to talk about. Uh, so before we get into that, if I could first perhaps ask everybody to quickly introduce themselves. Stacy, why don't we start with you? Sure, my name is Stacy Bolton. Uh, I'm a Senior Vice President and Chief Risk Officer for global services and corporate and institutional services here at the Northern Trust headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. Great, thanks, Stacey. Brian? My name is Brian Fahey. I'm the CEO and founder of my compliance office and uh, spent my whole career in technology for capital markets and about 16 years of that have all been in conduct risk compliance technology. Fantastic, and last but certainly not least, Steve. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Polanski. I run a special initiatives group within member supervision at FINRA. We do a variety of different things, but probably best known for our work on what used to be FINRA's priorities letter and uh, exam findings reports, which we last year consolidated into a single document. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Steve. So it's great. We have a great combination of folks, um, market participants, tech providers, sort of market oversight. So really excited for the <laughs> chat this morning. Thanks for being here. Um, so let's start at the highest level, Stacy. if we can start with you. Can you just tell us a little bit about sort of what has changed over the last two years or so in conduct oversight? Obviously, it's been a crazy, crazy two years. Um, so what's that experience been like for you and sort of what have you seen change in the area of conduct oversight? So I think that for, for me and, and for, I think, a lot of larger firms in financial services, the pandemic really did uh, change the way we work. And so what we were looking for is to see whether or not, uh, because of the significant change in the way we work, have there been any changes or anomalies in terms of behaviors in the workforce? Uh, meaning, do we uh, find ourselves uh, engaged in more uh, privacy breaches? Or do we see uh, more acts of um, you know, the, the circumvention of procedures um, that result in um, either errors, harm, or losses. Uh, and so we were looking specifically to see how the work from home environment can kind of change the landscape of conduct. And that is inclusive of whether or not people were actually logging in and working or, or you know, you know, at home in pajamas and um, you know, watching watching TV, um, and so so what we found is that really the the actual level of kind of work never diminished. So so the the people were doing the work that they were doing it, albeit we had to realize that folks were doing work at different times. So for folks that had jobs that didn't necessarily require them to be on a straight nine to five you know they may work you know nine to twelve and then take a three hour break to kind of walk the kids through the lesson plan for homeschooling uh, and then jump back on uh at three o'clock and work from three to seven so the the changing patterns in kind of the workforce and how people work uh, was a really significant thing that had to be analyzed through the lens of conduct uh, to ensure that we were doing the best for our employees and the employees were doing the best for our clients. So that would be kind of the biggest change, I would say, in conduct oversight. Great. And yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about sort of that, that 
you know, cultural view in a, in a little bit, but yeah, certainly an interesting year and new challenges. Steve, from a sort of an industry oversight perspective, I suspect you as an organization, the right had similar challenges and then obviously um, had to rethink how you looked at the industry as a whole, right? That, that's certainly true. And I, I'd echo a lot of what, what Stacy said. I and mean, I think what you're seeing is sort of an evolving kind of trust landscape as organizations learn to work in this remote environment, what may become a remote and hybrid environment as, as we move forward. I certainly hope that I never thought I'd say I want to get back into the office, but I do. I really want to see people. Um, and I think that seeing people and being able to engage with them face to face also uh, relates to the, the conduct question because part of how you judge and establish trust is through those personal contacts. So I think, you know, with what Stacy was saying, I think, you know, it's it's certainly true. It, you know, it's key, it's it's critically important to look at at conduct and to understand where things may may be going wrong. But I also think, you know, even before the the before COVID in the broader discussions about culture, I think it's important to keep in mind that the conduct perspective is not only about preventing what's wrong, but trying to foster a sound culture and, and good conduct and to think about the benefits that good conduct can bring for to a firm from a business perspective through higher levels of engagement with employees, more willingness to speak up in ways that can support better decision making, uh, potentially in the ability of firms to recruit uh, employees that they want because they have a good culture. And I think, you know, one of the issues at all firms is trying to get people to speak up when you're starting to see issues either that are kind of on the cusp of being misconduct or maybe they're blatantly blatant misconduct. But if you can foster this this speak up culture, uh, you can get on top of these issues earlier. And so, again, I think as one frames what conduct oversight, think about both. You know, you've got to think about the negative, but also think about the positive of, of good conduct. Right, right. It's not just about catching catching uh, sort of mistakes or bad actors, but sort of fostering the right environment so people don't don't have any interest in, in uh, sort of going down the wrong path. Um, and so, so great, Brian. I mean, that's a good segue over to you. I mean, what differences have all of these changes brought from a tech perspective? Tech allowed the market to keep functioning, no doubt. Um, but also was required to right keep sort of keep an eye and uh, ensure sort of compliance and ethical behavior as well. Correct? Yes, absolutely. I mean, thankfully, tech has kept us uh, enabled as uh, organizations around the world to continue doing the the activities, and it has enabled that remote capability. Thankfully, and you know, it's amazing how quickly we all know how amazing quickly it has turned and and, and continued to enable to be business as usual for the most part. So, but on the you know the conduct side you know the first part is always about you know the cultural aspects and you know, going going back to the standard maxim of you know trust but verify you know you end up using the technology to try and help with that verification with that surveillance with that monitoring to have some checks and balances around that but at the end of the day you know even to paraphrase you know drucker's phrase about you know culture culture eat surveillance for breakfast in terms of compliance you know i mean that's the most important part of all of this but you are expected to do that surveillance and monitoring. And the big thing we would see, of course, from the technology side is an acceleration of probably projects related to surveillance that um, that were, you know, maybe perhaps on some of the back burner, but, you know, be, people being remote, a desire to try and do what else can we do to do that verification part of this conduct risk. and. So it certainly has accelerated those types of projects uh, for everybody in the industry, uh, in the surveillance technology industry. Um, but you know, the, the real thing that it puts challenges on from a technology perspective are really about that volume of data and then the non-structured data as we would refer to it. And that's all the conversations, that's all the different types of media you're using, the chat and the capture, and um, there's been a lot of work around natural language processing, behavioral techniques, things like that. So it's brought some of those to the forefront as well around from a technology perspective. But the key is always around that huge volume of data that you are trying to capture and surveil. 
that is the biggest challenge that it is. But you know, at the end of the day, I think the broader themes behind it is you know there's a continuing expectation of better surveillance by, from the regulators uh, around the world, and uh, it's a continuing steady increase and part of it is because technology gets better at doing what it does and it gets seen that it can do certain things and then that's what's expected from from the market so it's a continually dialing up of technology needs for for that and it has been you know accelerated to some degree by obviously the remote working so that's kind of some of the things that you would see I guess I guess on one hand, you know, there's so much more data available, right, um, that you can mine. But then on the other hand, to your point, it's uh, there's so much more data available that it's more complicated to mine as well. Um, I mean, Stacey, if we can bring it back to you, what are some of the driving forces sort of beyond the obvious for the changes in compliance infrastructure? Is it about saving money, making the program more effective? Is it just about making sure the regulators uh, sort of don't come after you? I mean, what's, what do you feel like are the driving forces? Uh, just from a compliance risk perspective, I think it's kind of all of the above and. Uh, certainly, compliance departments are requiring uh, or being required to be more nimble um, and to do whatever they can to, to cost save. But they also are, are trying to make sure that their program is fit for purpose. Uh, and, and what that means is really ensuring that we're managing the kinds of compliance risks that we have um, as opposed to those that we don't have. It's, it's very difficult uh, for organizations to kind of, you know, try to buy some off the shelf, uh, you know, program and or technology without right fitting it for its specific organization and its specific culture. And so, Compliance organizations within uh, large financial institutions are really trying to be nimble and reactive uh, as well as proactive in terms of getting ahead of some of the trends. As I mentioned, you know, in the beginning, the pandemic has really changed the way we work. And so how does that changing landscape, uh, how do we react to that changing landscape and, and really think out and tease out what could go wrong? What are the risks that are looming around the corner that we tried? We need to try to get ahead of. Um, and, and are those risks, um, you know, going to redound into regulatory potential regulatory uh, violations, or are those risks going to redound into a change in culture? As Steve mentioned, it's like he, he's kind of antsy itching to get back to work, and and part of that is people like community. And so if, if you think about you know, the lack of community that the pandemic has caused, much of culture is carried in community. And so if you have really taken apart the community of employees, then who is a culture carrier? And the role of a culture carrier starts to change. And can you actually be a culture carrier on Zoom? So, so we're asking these questions in terms of, of, of what the infrastructure of compliance and risk looks like in the future, uh, as well as trying to meet the existing regulatory expectations and trying to be proactive in seeing where the regulators are heading. We're looking in spaces uh, in terms of where the regulators are heading as people are at home. Are they doing more you know, outside uh, work? And, and do we need to police that a little bit differently because they may try to change their schedules in a way where they can fit in a part-time job? Uh, you know, will we allow that? How does that work? All of that is a part of the new landscape. Uh, and so the, the compliance infrastructure is trying to be reactive uh, to the changes and then also in some ways uh, trying to look ahead to see how those changes will redound in uh, policy changes that may, may, may need to be necessary. Yeah, some really good food for thought there, Stacey. Thank you. And, and Steve, so uh, you know, are, you, I, are you at FINRO sort of working more than ever with your member firms to sort of work through some of these challenges? Um, 
Yes, and we, we put a lot of work in trying to get information out to firms about problems that we're seeing uh, ideally early on. Uh, this is a little bit off topic from this, but for example, we've been putting out more notices related to cybersecurity threats that we're seeing uh, so that firms can respond to those, typically where people are trying to impersonate FINRA and get the firms to respond, you know, by clicking on a link or, you know, creating an imposter website. But I think, you know, I really echo what Stacy said about all of the above. We've certainly seen firms uh, take steps to upgrade their infrastructure for, for all three of these reasons. Uh, and again, sort of picking up on what Stacy said, I think, you know, what concerns us sometimes, if you think of the firm as a system and make using a car as an analogy, if, if the business is the motor, you know, we, we get concerned sometimes when we see firms moving from, you know, their V6 motor to the V8 or the V12. And, or the electric you know, motor? Think of, <laughs> pardon? Or the or electric, electric motor. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if you think about Formula One, when, when people change the car, you need to change the suspension. You need to have the brakes. There needs to be a balance between all of these elements that make the system work. And we get concerned when we see, you know, focus on the engine because you can stick that Formula One engine in your car and you will drive it right off the road unless you're extraordinarily lucky. So I think maintaining the the, the balance and integration that, that Stacy was uh, talking about uh, is critical. And I think it kind of comes back to, uh, in part, a cultural uh, issue. You know, is compliance, is risk management at the table and understanding what's coming down the line from a business perspective? Is a firm going to be taking on new products or new customers or offering a new service or they are offering a product they already offer to a new type of customer. And all of those things are things that firms need to be thinking about from a compliance and risk management standpoint and others. Um, but, you know, it's obviously easier for compliance if they're at the table at the beginning and not being sort of presented with a fait accompli and certainly from a technology perspective if you're trying to catch up when things are already in process that that's really not not where you want to be um going back uh, to stacy's comments on regulatory expectations and putting in a bit of a shameless plug for an upcoming report uh, i mentioned earlier on this report that we put out the report on FINRA's examination and risk monitoring program. The next one of those will be coming out in early 2022. And in that document, this is not a priorities document, but this is a document that describes areas that FINRA frequently will look at through our examinations and our risk monitoring activities. And it presents information about problems that we're seeing. Uh, effective practices that we see firms implement to address those problems and sort of broader questions for consideration that compliance personnel can look at and kind of think through. We hope it helps them think through how to address these issues. So we're trying to provide the industry with information that can uh, position them to succeed uh, from a compliance perspective. Uh, and also by providing some, you know, transparency on where we see firms running into problems. It may not be the most exciting read in the world, but we hope it's a useful read. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, about, like, Steve's bringing an interesting part about sort of the cultural aspect here. And, you know, you know, compliance and risk professionals have been, you know, fighting for a while to be at the table. If there's a new product being discussed, we need to be part of that. And, you know, so much of that is helped by being around a conference room table and you're reading body language and, and, and viewing all of those things. And it helps with all of that drive for interaction and being part of that conversation. And it gets more difficult. And, you know, going back to the changes that have happened in the last two years, you know, it, it's just more challenging to do that over Zoom or WebEx or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, it's hopeful, you know, it's a concern, I think, for the industry. Has it lost some of that ground that it has gained over the last number of years being involved in those conversations to be that culture carrier, as, as Stacey described, uh, into those conversations to ensure that they're happening and, 
been appropriately addressed. So it's it's a challenge uh, that the COVID world has brought to us in in that respect. So you know it does mean that the the folks on the in the compliance teams have to work that harder to make sure they're part of those conversations um, at all times. And and then Brian, I can. I'm sorry. Ahead, I just wanted to add to that because I think that most of us in compliance and risk always recognize that the kind of meeting after the meeting so so that 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 COVID has not allowed us to participate in is that that meeting and then after the meeting is over everybody kind of you know moves into a different corner of the room and has a, a, a another conversation about what did you mean when you said this or what do you think about this it, it's in the absence of doing that and the absence of kind of compliance by walking around which was a really significant tool in the toolkit of most compliance professionals is just walking around and talking to people seeing what's going on seeing what folks are working on that was that was a part of how a, a, a program actually kind of got developed is really talking to folks uh, I'm fortunate enough as a risk officer to be at the table and and not be perceived as the party of no. And so in the ideation phase, you know, I'm there. And, and that is very helpful for your compliance and risk professionals to be there in the ideation phase of new products and services because you have the ability to say, okay, let me let me get back to you on how I think it would be best to structure this. Uh, so that we don't go outside of the guidelines of the regulators and so it's always better for them to ask permission than for them to ask forgiveness and hopefully the industry has learned that um brian can i ask you about sort of what changes or metrics folks can implement and then if we if we can sort of continue down that tech route um is it is it possible for firms to be more predictive now, given all of the data that's available, or do you, is that still some ways down the road? Well, I mean, the, the volumes of data are the biggest challenge, I think. You know, and, and I think historically, a lot of surveillance systems tend to monitor one set of data uh, separate from the other sets of data. But when you take conduct and culture in its broadest category, particularly conduct, for capital markets organizations, you kind of look at three areas you're, you're surveilling. You're surveilling the firm's transactions, whatever products they have. You're surveilling the employees and what they're doing and all their aspects. And increasingly, you're looking at the third parties that you're investing in or doing deals with or you know customers, all of those things. And it's in the interaction of those three core elements that you're looking for conduct. And the problem with conduct is, you know, it, you know you know, you can look at one individual data point and it's fine, it's helpful, and you can sort of indicate that you have followed these procedures to monitor that, but it's become much more challenging about, well, how do I monitor if the, the, the transactions are going on, what the employees are doing and who they're doing the business with? So, you know, the data harmonization, I think, challenges have come to the forefront. And historically, they did it on capital markets by looking at securities, and securities had common identifiers and you could monitor those. But I think there's been a broad trend around you're monitoring companies and companies are much harder to you know, know what the same company might be in one aspect of the organization as a customer. It might be investor in another part. You're, there's gifts going on, outside business activities. You're, you know, and, and, and trying to get that data harmonization is the first part of then being able to do more sophisticated techniques around monitoring things, behavioral analysis, um and, and aggregating those you have a better view and like the technology has gone and is capable around behavioral techniques and there's more capabilities around analyzing large volumes of data um and, and producing individual metrics about it but it really is back down to that intersection of trying to like monitor the three key elements around the transactions employees and the third parties you're doing business with together and data harmonization is best. And then if you have that data together, that really can then make the behavioral analysis, artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques really work very well together. But it's hard for a lot of organizations because we're still in a siloed data sets and individual monitoring or surveillance on those individual data elements. So metrics, 
you know, are, are fine and they'll give you around individual volumes of, let's say, you know, personal trading or, you know, issues around, you know, um, trade surveillance or individual items and they're all good. But the real key, I think, is sort of having the sort of more holistic view, having the data set together and then having good using technology to help with those that analysis on top of that integrated data set. So, the, I mean, the changes that are going on, as I said, are, you know, some great tools that are evolving around, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, around natural language processing. And this is where you can take news input, you can have tools that read all that vast amounts of data or do it around, you know, unstructured data like chat and emails. And they're, they're getting better at being able to scintillate that and be able to um, understand that more. So that's a major change that's going on. You get to see it actually in analysis of regulations as well, trying to define your obligations. So taking out the, the regs and sort of reading through that in a natural language processing way and coming out with those. There's some very good firms that do all of that now. Um, but it's the, it's, the, it's the final part of really sort of bringing the data together that is the more challenging. So the tools are getting better, the technology is getting better, and you know it's getting better at the unstructured data. But you know the metrics of individual things have been there for a while. It's trying to like bring it to another level is the hardest part. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like there'll be some machines reading Steve's report as well as some humans uh, from the sounds of it. <laughs> hey, um, you know, just uh, in part in responding to part of what Brian said. Uh, I mean, I think the whole that the whole area of natural language processing and how it's being applied is 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 fascinating. It's something we're working on here at Finra. Uh, the UK FCA actually is uh, has a. I'm not sure where they are in the process, but they're working on making some elements of their rule book machine readable. Um, oh, and it's that. I, yeah. know, I don't know how, how far along that is, but it really is, I think, quite exciting to see some of the things that technology may, may be able to facilitate. But I think also with respect to metrics, I, I think some of the things we've seen is, you know, sometimes there's a red flag, but typically, when something goes wrong, it's it's not usually one thing. There's sort of a little mosaic around it, um, and so I think that's just important to keep in mind uh, as as you, as you think about about the types of metrics you use. And you know, you know, from what we see, you can talk about culture at a firm level and conduct at a firm level, and then you kind of get down to the branch level or a desk, you know, and knowing where you need to look, especially in a big organization, can be exceedingly challenging um but uh yeah it's a it's a challenge um but it's, uh, you, you need to think about your business and where the risks lie and, and try and focus in there right and kevin can i add just the the sense that um we have the potential metrics that that could be predictive and, and i think most uh, HR councils will will kind of shy away from uh, the 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 naming of of something as predictive. I think I think that there is some angst around uh, HR council and uh, saying that we have a predictive model. Um, but but irrespective of that, I think that there are some concerns um, in firms around kind of the subcultures within an organization, especially if that organization is global in nature, you, you may see anomalies or what may look like anomalous behavior that can be explained when you look at the culture, whether it's a people culture or racial culture uh, within a people group in a particular uh, demographic or location. And so I think it's important to understand that these models are not meant to be one size fits all. There are uh, things that we have to be able to understand and explain, you know, why, why don't I have a whole lot of uh, hotline calls out of India? Uh, and, and, and really explain that, it, is it because there is nothing that's happening in India that is worthy of the hotline? Or is it because of a culture that presupposes um, the culture of the organization, 
because you know we we may only be a couple of years into that location and so the culture of the location at that time is stronger than the culture of the organization and so you have to be aware of these kind of differences and and not let metrics explain away uh those differences and apply a bias over uh the metrics that you have so metrics are tricky in um and what they're telling you you have to be able to read the room and then read the metrics if, if that makes sense yeah that yeah. there is the, 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 sorry go ahead brian well oh, no, i was just gonna say there's another aspect to you know the, what stacy is talking about there in terms of predictive um, metrics and you know this is always you know a tech, i think compliance is a little bit different in using some of these techniques versus general industry and part of the reason in that is you know you've got to be able to understand the understand if you get this wonderful predictive algorithm that has been you know wonderful artificial intelligence that sort of reads all these sets of data and you know takes in all kinds of different uh, elements to it very very frankly a lot of people won't be able to like explain that or understand it and if the compliance team can't do that they can't explain it to the examiner and that is going to create a lot of challenges and so it's one you know it sounds great about artificial intelligence but it's more challenging in the compliance world because you've got to be able to understand that algorithm every every ai solution is still designed and built as an algorithm by a person and it's absorbing data, it's doing interpretations, and this could be very, very sophisticated and very useful. But if you can't explain it, it's gonna be very difficult to use in a compliance monitoring world. Um, I think as Stacy said, it can be useful to kind of give indicators and you know, mention that, well, the relative metric of that um, whistleblowing in that country is much lower than all the others. Why? Is it cultural, is it not? And it's very helpful, tools can do that and, and present that but real AI that is complicated, that ends up being a black box that you don't, it's hard to make that in a place for the compliance world because of those need to be able to understand what it does. And so we, we probably have about 10 minutes left. I, I think I wanna bring us back to that, that cultural conversation or right, about creating the right culture. So I think there's some, you know, some, some view all of this surveillance as scary big brother, like you don't trust me. So how do you balance sort of the, the obvious need for this kind of surveillance that we've been talking about and conduct oversight with still creating sort of this, the right culture, right? The right trust and culture within a firm. And I'll just sort of throw that out whoever wants to be brave enough to jump in first on that. Well, seeing as we do the surveillance, I better, I, I'll jump in a bit on us because I would say like, you know, the culture, is, it's not about necessarily balancing these things. The culture is number one. The culture, as I said, it eats the surveillance for breakfast again, to use that, uh, uh, butcher that phrase, but, you know, so you've got to get that right. And the surveillance is there to demonstrate and prove out that you're doing that. Um, so I don't know, it's about, you know, comparing them. They're, they're two separate streams. And as I said, culture is more important. And the surveillance is then mm -hmm. very important to, you know, people who are trying to avoid the culture you have created, those people that are around the edges, you're using the technology and the surveillance techniques to try and identify them and try to ensure that you're making it a place that it's not a comfortable place for those types of individuals to be in and that you, you know, they just don't be part of your organization. And I think that's one of the most useful tools of the surveillance aspects of it to know that, that it's been monitored and that, you know, you can call it big brother, but yes, it is being monitored and we're there to try and help the culture to ensure that these people don't get uh, able to do those kinds of activities that are nefarious or inappropriate or rogue um, and that's what the real key is as, as well as just obviously the regulator expenses <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but from a from a culture aspect that's the real delivery around it in my in my view i would say oh, go ahead steve if you want to. <laughs> so to me i think you know sort of it's been said a lot before, but like culture starts with the tone from the top, you know, and you need leadership, you know, at the executive level, at the business unit level, you know, all, you know, all the way down that is consistently communicating the ethical and cultural expectations of the firm and not only communicating them, but uh, 
demonstrating them in their actions and decision making. I think, you know, how firms manage conflicts of interest is one area where you can make an ethical statement about how, how you do your business. But, you know, we have to recognize it's complex. You know, firms may have multiple different types of relationships with a single entity where, you know, in one capacity, they may be a, a fiduciary and in another capacity, they may be a, a counterparty. And so then there's, a, you know, a communications element with the, the customer or client to make sure that, you know, there's not a misunderstanding of which role the firm is engaging with. So there's this tone from the top, how you manage conflicts. I think you have to look at firms' incentive structures. You know, you can, you can say a lot of great things uh, rhetorically, but if your incentive structures are aligned in a way that uh, does not support your, your ethical objectives, uh, that, can, that can really be uh, a problem. So, you know, to, to Brian's point, I think the, the surveillance is obviously a key kind of guardrail here, but you need, you need the consistent messaging. It, it starts at the top. And I think that what Steve says in terms of the incentive structures and what people are rewarded for, uh, and, and what people are um, penalized for is really important because it sends a message uh, to folks that, uh, you know, integrity matters, following procedures matters. Um, even though winning business matters, how you win the business matters. And so even though you, you may do a, a, a win a big you know, piece of business, if you also have gifts and entertainment violations, um, connected to winning that business, it puts the whole firm at risk. And so that's where compliance sets those guardrails because it matters to us in terms of what kind of culture we wanna have and what integrity looks like. Uh, most firms have core values. Um, are we really living out our core values? And that's when, when the rubber meets the road. It, it's a test of your core values and whether or not you're going to live those out uh, how you incentivize uh, your employees, um, both in terms of, you know, winning business and in terms of, you know, how they comport themselves uh, every day as, as a corporate citizen. So I, I think that for me, it's really about making sure culture um, really is, is solid and aligns with our business principles and our core values. And, and, and Stacy, I have to ask, this is a bit tangential, but ESG has become such a focus in the industry in general in a variety of ways. The regulators are looking at better disclosure and investors are more interested in those in, sort of in investments with high ESG scores. It, does, does this sort of, you know, a firm's integrity feels like it's part of the S, it's part of the G. Should we, should we think about sort of ethical culture and governance as part of that ESG scoring in the end? Is that, does that come up in your conversations ever? Yeah, I, th I think so. And, and, and one of the ways that I believe uh, that it is, is when you look at, you know, most, most firms have, you know, ESG reports or uh, some level of sustainability reports, um, that G is really important to a lot of the both kind of investors, counterparties, uh, the stakeholder community in general, how we are governed and how we manage the governance of an organization is important. They wanna make sure that we, all of these stakeholders wanna make sure that firms are managing in, 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 in an ethical way um, because ethical companies tend to do better. So it's, it's not just, uh, a matter of uh, you know making money, making money. Ethical ethical companies tend to make money for longer periods of time, and so I think investors are really concerned about a G um, as well as the E and the S. Uh, I, I can tell you that a lot of folks wanted to know what we were doing around Me Too, what we were doing around Black Lives Matters. Th those are social constructs that companies now can't get away from. They they can't just not have a position. And so it, it's, it's really important uh, in the future how much social gets integrated with corporate. 
For sure. It matters for corporate okay. relationships within capital markets, and it matters to retail investors, right? It's all up and down the chain, for sure. I also think it matters to employees, you know? And so um, I know certainly within FINRA, uh, we have these uh, employee resource groups and, you know, there's been a lot of discussion internally around, uh, you know, racial justice issues. Uh, and I think, again, you know, it's also for your employees. And I think, uh, from a recruiting perspective and retention perspective, uh, those 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 issues are important there as well. Sure. Yeah, I think ESG is very much a reflection of that broader social trend around expectations of you know the financial services industry generally, who you work for, the employees are more pushing for you know uh, appropriately ethical and with good culture organisations, and that has extended then to who are you doing business with. Who are you investing in? And the ESG, you know, analysis of those entities, um, it has created a broader social expectation and desire that is driving the whole culture of the industry up to being, you know, monitoring who you do business with and that they have appropriate ESG capability, or you know, that their ESG, I don't know, I hate to use the word score, but their evaluation of their ESG is a is that they're at a certain level. And I think it's bringing up the entire industry. And so ESG is another important factor. And it gets back into that third element for, for, for how we look at it in terms of the transactions you do as, a, as an organization yourself, the employees that you have, and then who you're doing business with. And ESG is a, a great sort of ability. To, it's still evolving and maturing, obviously, but it's a great way to evaluate those third party entities that you're doing business with. And so it, it's, again, those cultural, the, you know, the culture within our organizations that we work with, but we're also part of that greater ecosystem of the, the capital markets industry and trying, which has, let's say, mixed views in the outside the industry, but it does help, I think, to bring up the overall view of the industry. And so we're just about out of time. Brian, maybe we can wrap up with you. If you can take out your crystal ball, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of what you as a firm, you personally see sort of coming in this space in 2022, what's the next evolution? Um, is all this work, you know, that started in March 2020 really gonna, gonna come to fruition in 2022? What, what should we expect? Well, nothing moves too, too, fa too quickly in the compliance world. I don't know that it sort of turns <laughs> on any time, but I think there is a continual um, focus on trying to like absorb the data into a structured way to be able to better do analysis and be able to provide better information for compliance teams to, to, to do those evaluations. But it gets down to something a little bit more basic that I think a lot of organizations are still trying to do, which is let's automate a lot of what we do manually more using technology so that the compliance teams can be looking at issues, looking at broader elements and not doing a lot of the ticking and tying and repeating activities. That's the biggest impact that I think technology can provide for the industry. And I think, you know, to be honest, the real sort of artificial intelligence, the predictive, I think we're a ways away from that. I think firms are still just trying to get their own systems better amalgamated, their data sets better amalgamated, and getting better metrics and dashboards and things themselves. So we have a way to get to, before we get too sophisticated on some of those wonderful technology techniques, and we just got to get the data right. Right, great point. And as Stacy rightly pointed out, right, there's a, you still need the humans to be able to interpret the, the better and better data that comes out uh, sort of of the surveillance technology. So fantastic. Uh, gentlemen, this was great, fantastic conversation. Thanks for being so sort of engaging and open with us. Um, thanks everybody for listening this morning. We will uh, send around the recording uh, of the webinar so keep an eye out for that. Um, and again, thanks so much uh, guys for joining. Look forward to hopefully speaking again next year. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you.